Amen. You know, as Alan was sharing that, there's so many thoughts I have today, and and sorry, I'm not preaching off scribbles this morning, as I did last week. I know everyone said, I don't know how to take it. Everyone said that they preferred my scribble preaching. Um, so, I, I mean, I'm assuming this is still fine, too. <laughs> I know it is. I'm not. When Alan talked about the presence of the Lord coming, I, I just had, like, Alan, what you said. When we see Jesus, when he returns, I, I wanted to share a story and why it's so, why it's so important for us to make sure that we have our hearts right before the Lord at all times, that we are doing everything we can to make sure that we are pushing towards the purity and the righteousness of Jesus Christ that he bled and died for, and now we are clothed in Christ, we now wear that. John the Beloved, right? John the Beloved, on the night before Jesus uh, died, the, the evening before, what was he doing in, the, in, the, in, the last, in that last supper? What do we see him doing, according to the, the gospel accounts? He was so close to Jesus, where was he? He was right here. He was reclining upon Jesus. He knew and he had the revelation that he was the one that Jesus loved. I know we joke around about it a lot, but I don't think that's a pride statement in the Gospels. I think it's a revelation that when he writes about himself as the one that Jesus loved, I believe it was a revelation that overtook him. And I think he wrote that, honestly, I, I believe, I can't prove it, Jeremy's believer, that he wrote that through tears. I'm the one that Christ loved. I'm the one that, that he loved, Right? And so you see Jesus, you see John, sorry, so close to Jesus, but at his, re when John catches a glimpse of Jesus in heaven, what happens? It says he falls like a dead man at his feet. And I want to read that to you because I want us to understand some things here. I know that there's grace and I'm not trying, I know that the church has been heavy on uh, condemnation style preaching and that's not what I want to do but I also want to make sure that we preach the reality of the righteousness and the truth of Jesus Christ there's a part of me that can relate to this and and I'm, I'm constantly Lord mold me transform me as I know many of us are praying in this place right but it, when John sees him I was cut to it Revelation 1 12 then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning I saw I get seven golden lampstands sorry what Keep on down. Sorry, I'm going to go to 12. It keeps on talking about all his, his things. When I, uh, 17, sorry. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I'm the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys to death and hates. Right? And so imagine that. He's saying this over John, but John already saw him after his resurrection. John saw him when Jesus walked through the walls, and he was there, and he already showed him uh, the wounds in his side and in his hands. He was there upon the beach when they were fishing again after, after Jesus had died, and he came back, and he fed them, and he breathed upon them, John 20, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. But this one was different. John was taken into a vision, and he saw Jesus in his heavenly place and, he, and, and as righteous, I believe, as John was. I believe that Peter, J Paul, John, I believe as people walking on the earth, there's probably few, if I can even say that correctly because we all fall short, but more righteous as them. John himself, who was dedicating his life at that last part when he was on the island of, uh, when he was, um, not isolated, whatever he was, sent away, uh, when he was sent away on this island, spending his days in prayer, so in a place when he's in constant prayer, in a place when you probably can't get any more healthier in spirit, he sees Jesus, and what does he do? He falls like a dead man. Awesome. Like, wow, Lord, give us the conviction in our heart to make sure that we really strip ourselves of worldly thought and ideas because we can't afford them in these days. We need to have that zeal for us. The great option came from something again uh, of that weekend that Ad Adam and I were away, and there was a comment that was said that struck something in me, and I built this sermon around it. Uh, the reason for the scribbles was because I came in, and Rachel was actually supposed to preach that, that Sunday, but I was like, babe, I got to preach. I have to preach this morning. After what uh, was in there, and obviously she was gracious enough, so she's going to be preaching in two weeks. That, si that message the Lord poured on her heart. But as we're there, the great option came to me, and he was talking about evangelism. And I want us to get to the place when we understand something, that evangelism is for every single one of us. I know that we can all evangelize, but I have found myself praying, asking the Lord to bring the evangelist into the church. Right? The fivefold ministry. you got apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors evangelists right and so as i've been praying this prayer but i realized i was praying the prayer all wrong because even though there's a place for the office of a prophet what does paul encourage all the believers to do when it comes to spiritual gifts he said pursue what prophecy 
right? He's like, I desire that every single one of you in this room will prophesy. Does that mean every single one of us in this room are going to step into the office of a prophet? No, right? That means, but in the same light, if we can understand that scripture, that means that every single one of us here are called to evangelize. It doesn't mean that we are going to step into the office of an evangelist, but every single one of us here has been clothed with power from on high to reach evangelism. Why? Because evangelism is, is probably one of the deepest things to the Father's heart because that directly affects souls that are lost that are going to be coming back into the kingdom. I believe the greatest authority is going to come through evangelism because you're going after something that the blood of Jesus paid for. Not all of us will be evangelists. All of us can prophesy. Right here, when we get into the great option, right, that's what I heard him say, a guy named Ben Fitzgerald. He said, the great, uh, the great commission has turned into a great option in the church today. Yeah, it's a great option for us. I like that. That's a good idea. Make disciples of all nations. Where's the evangelist at? I'll see you later. Right? That's what it's turned into. And I heard some, some stunning reports from what he said, uh, from what he was preaching on, and he said, he said this, he said, believe it or not, we'll, we'll preach it here in a second. Do you know that according to his study, I forget his resources, I think it was through that big popular one, Barnum, but I'm not, I'm not sure, right? That, that said that only 4% of Christians today actually lead people to Jesus. And when you think of that, whether that's the absolute number or not, it doesn't matter. 4, 6, 10, 8%, it doesn't matter. It was under 10, even if it's under 15, even if it's under 20. Let's go wild and say, even if that number was 50, is that still acceptable? No. So forget the percentage. That's the one that they found. But that hit me. 4% of Christians actually lead people to Jesus. Now, I have had the privilege of doing that, just being in ministry as long as I have been. But I started to tell Rachel, I said, my life has not reflected the amount of souls saved that it should have because of what I believe in Jesus Christ. Did I beat myself up over it with condemnation? No. Conviction, saying, Lord, my life needs to change from this day on. My life needs to change from this day on. Let's continue to, to read this. There's a difference, and this is what, uh, my, my message isn't this, Ben's, Fitz, Ben's whatever, Fitzgerald, his message was based around this. His best message was based around there's a difference between being a Christian and a Christian witness. And I believe in his thing was most of Christianity has fallen back on the title of being a Christian, but have actually lost the Christian witness. Right? And I'm like, ooh, that's interesting thought. The Great Commission has become more of a great option. Let's read this in James 2, 14 to 20. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but does not have the works? Can such a faith save him? I know there's probably questions off this verse right here, which I'm going to answer. Can such a faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in shalom, go in peace. But I chose this translation because remember, we did a whole study on peace versus shalom, and the shalom from the Bible is much more rich than the definition of peace that we use, which is why I placed it here. So this is the word. If we say to someone who is hungry and lacks food and is naked, go in shalom, keep warm, and, and be well fed, but you do not give them what the body needs, what good is that? So also, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. Well, wait a minute. We're saved by grace, not by works. You're absolutely right. I'm going to be touching on that in just a moment. Right? We need both of these. Let's continue to go here. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe God is one, and you do well to do so. But some translations say, I haven't memorized that one. That's funny. The demons also believe and shudder. But do you want to know, empty person, that faith without works is dead? Isn't that such a blast, that underlined word right there? Even demons believe and shudder. Even demons believe that Jesus is the Christ. They know it. As Alan said, they were met with a great surprise when they thought that they had won. And Jesus took captivity captive. Woo! And led us into freedom. Come on, right? But even here, even demons believe. So my life as a redeemed saint, one who was a sinner, who now has become a son, my life better, my faith better be that, so much greater than demons who also believe that Jesus is the Christ. Let's just think about that for a moment. No condemnation, conviction, things that have been flowing through my head. And I'm going to end off with the power of God here. So I'm going into a good place. The, the Band-Aid rip is what's there. Uh, the rhetorical question, is your faith greater than demons who also believe that Jesus is the Christ? Rhetorical question, again. 
I'm not trying to lead us into a place where we're beating ourselves up. I'm trying to lead us into a place where we step into the fullness of the power of God, which Jesus Christ died for us to have. And the Father says, please. And we say, yes, Father, I hear you. I'm coming. Right? Powerful lines right there. The Great Commission has become a great option. So what about this? What about our faith, our salvation is in uh, Christ alone and not by works? Yes. So how can he saying that faith without works is dead then? It makes it sound like that faith, that works have to be a part of our salvation. Right? Well, let's go over some of these verses that talk about following Jesus. Mark 28, or not 28, I don't, 834. Then he called the crowd along with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wants to... Follow me, follow after me. He must deny himself, which means a lot of the, I'm doing this for me, me, I deserve this, I want this, I want, 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 no. He must deny himself, take up his cross, or become like a servant, because the cross was the greatest display of servanthood. He must deny himself, take up his cross, become like a servant, and keep following me. Let's continue to go a little further on understanding this. If any man serves me, Right? Because number one, what does Paul call himself? We call it a servant to the Lord. But the word you've heard me preach on starts with a B is actually bond servant. And what's the difference between a bond servant and a servant? Remember? Shout it out. Choice. You are saying, hey, you set me free. I am choosing to serve you for the rest of my days. A bond servant. We've become bond servants to Jesus where we're saying, Lord, you are my master. I'm choosing right now in my heart that I'm going to serve you until my last breath. Well, serving Jesus is more than just coming to church on Sunday, confessing that Jesus is Lord and doing a little bit of worship and praise. It's more than going to a Bible study on Wednesday nights. Everything that has to do with serving Jesus has to do with the reflection and saving of souls. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send workers where? Into the harvest because we need people in the harvest field. The whole point of our very existence right now is to help people who are currently lost and dying experience the power of the living God, introduce them to Jesus so Jesus can show them the Father and that the glory of the Lord will intervene in the moment. It has to be about souls. It has to be. Where I am, there my servant will be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Where was Jesus? All through the Gospels, where was he? He was in places just like this, but where else was he? He was out on the streets hugging the people that no one would hug, going to the people that probably lied and cheated and stealed to get stuff, right? People that you can't trust anyways from, from a worldly standpoint. And Jesus was going in there, and he was setting people free in the streets as well as in the church. In Isaiah, check out, we see this, that it's not just sacrifice. And when I say a sacrifice, I mean a sacrifice of praise. It has to go beyond a Sunday or a Wednesday morning or a Bible study group. Do you know that the church was originally set up? Know what Sunday should be like, and I pray. Look, I understand that when, the, when something moves a little uh, off, off center, it's not the best idea to take it and jerk it all the way back where it's supposed to be because you'll lose people in that mix, right? The healthiest way to... Steer something, like just think of the obvious example, it's kind of stupid, but it proves my point. Driving in a car. Have you ever been in a car with someone? You're like, oh, you're supposed to turn there. And like, what? Right? And then you just fly off to the window and put your greasy little face on the window. And then, it's just, then you got to wash it later and all other stuff. Like my kids' hands all over my car windows. Right? When it's there, you can't just jerk a car one way. In the same way, if the church has gone a little off course, you can't just, I can't just show up on a Sunday morning and say, hey, we've got it all wrong. Here's what we're going to do. Because we don't have it all wrong. We have parts of it wrong. We have elements wrong, but the heart is right. Right? So you have to take what was over here and you have to bring it back, but you have to bring it back slowly. The early church, when they gathered together, this would be a place not where souls would be saved, even though, yes, the souls could be saved, but this would be where the teacher, the preacher, the event would speak into the body, empower you. You would go into your neighborhood, invite all the lost to come to your house. Grow groups really shouldn't be about advanced teaching. That should be this. Grow groups should be about you inviting people from the streets that don't know Jesus Christ into your home so they can encounter the power of the living God in your home. That's what was supposed to happen. You come here, you get filled up, you take a brother or two, you go out into the streets and say, hey, how about you come over to my house on Tuesday night? I'm going to feed you, 
right? You come over to this place, you have a Thanksgiving of prayer, which we see the model in the house groups. Jesus is still praised. You talk about Jesus, and you begin to share the gospel, the good news, which I talked about last week, is the person of Jesus Christ. And you begin to explain the person of Jesus Christ. They come into an encounter with his love. They see the Father, and you've just brought one more into the kingdom. That is... We should all be having grow groups in this room, and not just grow groups, which are, is great to talk about lessons. I love to nerd out on scripture stuff. It absolutely fascinates me. Some people don't have the same passion still for Jesus, just the same way of study. Um, that's not an insult, which is fine. But I need to make sure, I need to make sure, Jeremy Burden, I'm telling you as a pastor, but you should have the same desire as me because we are all a part of the same body. The body exists to help people who are walking in darkness see a great light, who is Jesus Christ, just as we have walked in the light. We need to help people step into the glory of God. That is how our life is supposed to live. One of the most haunting nightmares I ever had was a guy named Bob Jones. And not from the, uh, there's two Bob Jones in the Christian circles, not the university guy, the prophet guy. He said he had a dream, and in the dream, it was, it was the end of time, and he was coming into heaven. And he remembers feeling all these thoughts in his heart about going to see Jesus. And he knew that he had made it. He was about to hear the well done. He was so happy. And, and then all of a sudden, he saw all these people to his left that were going into a different door. And they're going into the door, walking into hell. And he said that the, the, the dream turned from a quick bliss of awesomeness into quick hell and horror for himself because even though he was going to heaven, people who were going through that door were crying out to them, I knew you my whole life, but you never warned me. We think we don't want to anger someone. Adam and I have both talked about this, that, that, that atheist guy with the long hair, that's my height. He's the one who said, how much do you have to hate someone if you know they're falling into a hole and not warn them? awesome thought, right? But we're so worried about how we're going to come across. You and I have been clothed with power from on high for this very reason. It's not just anyone who serves me must follow me. What's the servant? Isaiah 1. It's in uh, Isaiah 1 right here. Basically saying that you think that I desire I desire sacrifice. He's like, sacrifice is not what I'm desiring before you. What does he want you to do? Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, and bring justice to the fatherless and plead the widow's case. What does this all have to do right here with people? Specifically people where? Who are walking in darkness and have not seen a great light. That is what he wants from us, right? He said, you're, you're, uh, you're, your sacrifices have become a burden to me. That's what he says earlier. Right? Let's continue to go here. Luke 9, 1 to 2 and to 6. You've heard me teach about this many times. When Yeshua, Jesus, called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority over the demons to heal disease, or over demons and to heal diseases. He sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. You've heard me say this. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. We talked about that last week, right? So, and I'm coming into... Uh, pretty big home run stretch at the end of this. This is a part, do you realize the Great Commission is the same thing? Matthew 28, which we're going to talk about. Where was the Great Commission to? It was to the whole world, right? Here, this is like a Great Commission in training because they didn't go out into the whole world. They went into the region that Jesus had sent them to that was allotted for ministry. And so it's the same words right here as Jesus sends them out two by two. It's, it's, a, it's like a pre-run, it's a pre-trial of the Great Commission. He's getting the disciples ready to, for what is going to happen when Jesus ascends into the heaven and takes his seat at the right hand of the Father. It's what you and I are supposed to do. Our life should evolve around the Great Commission. Our desire, our greatest desire should be for souls saved and our, and our energy should be seeking the Lord and hearing what the Father is doing. He sends them out, but he gives them authority. Again, kingdom of God is not a matter of just of talk, but of power to, to over all demons and to heal all diseases. And he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. So they went out and began traveling throughout the villages. That's not the world. That's the region. The villages proclaiming the good news and healing everywhere. So he does this for the twelve. Well, that's obvious. Jeremy, the twelve apostles were hired to do that. Yes. Luke 10. Then he takes it one step further. I want to pause there, and I want you to read that first bold word with me. Now, after these things, so after these things being after sending out the 12, right, the Lord assigned 70. So what does that tell you? 70 others. What does that tell you? Luke 9, he sends out the 12. Luke 10, he sends out 70. 
more. So I do not believe the 12 are in this group from that verbiage right there. He sends out 70 others. He gets it bigger, right? Just like the Great Commission. It started with 12, then hopefully he went to 24, if everyone led with someone to the Lord, and he keeps on multiplying, 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 right? So you see this here. He sends out the 12 in Luke 9, and then he takes the other followers that aren't really mentioned much, but we know they're here. We know they're in Acts, because there's many in the upper room that get, that get baptized in Acts 2. There's many in the upper room that get baptized with the Holy Spirit in Acts 4, right? We know there's other believers, and so there's a ministry here. So so he sent out 70 others, and he sent them two by twos to go into every town. Still, it's still the region. Again, it's not the world. This is the Great Commission all over again. I don't want to stay on a trial run because it was very real. He, he, they were preparing the region for the glory of Jesus Christ. You and I are called to prepare the world for the glory and revealing of Jesus Christ. It's all around souls. It's not the great option, it's the great commission. You and I have been commissioned to do something. It's not an option for you and I. And if you and I are really a bond servant, then the great commission will no longer be a great option. It will literally be a commission from the Lord who we call king. And we come into this place, uh, sent them out two by twos to go into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he was telling them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Can I say the followers or the witnesses are few? Can we relate this scripture to today and say the harvest is plentiful? Because the harvest is plentiful. They're turning every single which way. But the witnesses, the Christian witnesses of God are few. Workers are few. Therefore, beg the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Go forth, look, I'm sending you as lambs amongst the midst of wolves, which means that in the natural point of view, you're going to be outpowered. Me in the flesh will be outpowered. I'm a lamb in the midst of wolves when it comes to evangelism. But one greater than the strong man lives in me through the power and baptism of the Holy Spirit. Whatever town you enter, whatever town you enter and they welcome you, eat whatever they set before you, no problem. Right? Then heal the sick in that town and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. See, you heal, you do, you proclaim. Ooh, I want to jump to the end. I can't because it's, it's the Great Commission, not option. This is the Great Commission according to Mark and to Matthew. Now you tell me if this verbiage doesn't sound very similar to what we just read in Luke 9 and Luke 10. Right? This is the one in Mark first. He told them, go into all the world now, not into the villages. Go into all the world and proclaim the good news. Capital G, capital N, why? Because the good news is not a story. It is a person. Jesus Christ himself is the good news. He is the gospel. So to preach the gospel is to preach Jesus. One of the things I've been thinking about right now, and, and I might change my mind Sunday, so these are the things that probably a preacher shouldn't do, but I'm just going to do. The more you study about Jesus being in our midst, let's just be real here. The glory of, remember what we talked about last week, or even this Wednesday, if you didn't miss it, that God said to Israel when the manna appeared on the ground the next morning, the manna is a physical picture of Jesus Christ coming in the flesh, the bread that came down from heaven. Jesus is the living bread that came down from heaven. The night before, he told Israel, wait in the morning, and you're going to see my glory in the morning. Who is the glory? The glory is the bread. Who is the bread? The bread is Jesus. Right? Any works that happen, what's the response? It's the glory of God intervening into the moment, and then we worship God. The glory of God, according to ancient Hebrew uh, literature in, into the Aramaic, which was written, the glory of God was always known as the way in which God chose to reveal himself. He chose to reveal himself in Jesus. He chose to reveal himself in a pillar of fire at night. He chose to reveal himself in whatever you want to call. The glory of God is how God chose to reveal himself. So if we pray for the sick right now and the sick get healed, was that me or Jesus? So what happened there? The glory of God came. God revealed himself of the miracle that took place, which is why Jesus said, even the works that I do testify about who I am. Who is he? He is the good news. So this work that Jesus did when he laid hands on the sick and they recovered, it testified to who he was. It testified to the glory, the glory who is Jesus Christ. And so I believe that when it says, when two or more are gathered in my name, when you touch something together, that Jesus, who is very much, you can go wherever he wants, but he is a person. <laughs> He came up and rose in a new heavenly body, right, to prove to all of us, like Jesus did at first, hey, 
Don't, don't worry about it. Watch me. As I die, so will you. But as I resurrect, so will you. And so now the body of Jesus, the person of Jesus, is in the right hand of the Father. But the Father and Jesus are one, so are the Holy Spirit. Three into one. The Holy Spirit now lives in us, so therefore Jesus now dwells richly within our hearts. But the body of Jesus is, it, is at the right hand of the Father in the lampstands, walking in the heavenly places. And so I believe that that is talking about the works that the believers do. That if Adam and I were to agree with something right there and the miracle takes place, that is Jesus being in our midst, the glory of God, the good news, the gospel that is here that brings glory to the Father. Let's continue to go with this. Oh, sorry, all this. Go into all the world, proclaim good news to every creature. He who believes and is immersed or baptized shall be saved, but he who does not believe shall be condemned. These signs will accompany those that believe. In my name, they'll drive out demons. Yes, they will speak with new languages and tongues. They'll handle snakes, talking about having authority over the enemy, not what we see today with the snake handling in some types of churches. And if they drink anything deadly, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will get well. Then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into the heavens and sat down at the right hand of God, and he went out and proclaimed everywhere the Lord was working with them and confirming the word by the signs that followed. So we see here in Mark that Jesus takes his seat where? At the right hand of the Father, Jesus says here in Matthew's version, Matthew 28, and Jesus said to them, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, evangelism, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, which one is it? As you always say, yes, Brad says, yes, they're both right. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. The resurrected body of Jesus ascended into the clouds and now seated in heavenly places. You and I are seated within Christ in heavenly places, hallelujah, right, because of the Holy Spirit of God. I think we need to understand the power of the Holy Spirit that's alive and active in our lives right now. The power of the Holy Spirit allows us to be seated with Christ in, in heavenly places. The power of the Holy Spirit is what allows the reality of the Father and the Son to have now come and made his home in us. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that allows us to understand revelation in the word. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that flows through us to see miracles happen. It's the power of the Holy Spirit to see those and pray over those who are tormented by demons be set free. It is the power of the Holy Spirit alive in you and me. The power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, first, I urge that requests, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving made on behalf of who? All people. All people. For kings and all who are in authority. So that may we live a peaceful life in godliness and respectfulness. This is, a good, this is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. He desires all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and all men. A human. A human. God is a spirit, but he's, but he's Jesus. Wow, like let that, mm. Messiah Jesus, Jesus the Christ, Messiah Yeshua, Messiah, another word for Christ, Jesus Yeshua, Greek into Hebrew, same thing. Who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony at the proper time. But who are we supposed to be praying for? All people. What's our goal? All people. I need to be interceding for the saints. I need to be interceding for the sinners. Even I'm not saying that in a condescending way interceding for those who are walking in light and interceding for those who are walking in darkness. I need to be interceding for all those. He even says to pray for your kings and all who are in authority. So whoever wins the election on Tuesday, we better be praying for that person. And I want to tell you something. If you will not pray for Kamal Harris and if you will not pray for Donald Trump, then you are not walking in the shoes of a son and daughter of the Most High God. I'll say that again. You are not because we are called to pray for all people. Now, obviously, we need to do, we have a great honor in this nation. We get to cast a vote, so make sure you do that, right? We get, the Lord has placed us. We should be very thankful that the Lord has placed us in a, in a, in a nation that allows us stuff to do, so we can say an extra thank you of praise as we go to the poll boxes, but make sure you do that. What you should be doing, though, is praying for your kings and all who are in authority, the president, the vice presidents, the people that run over Bristol, right, the people, the nation. You need to be praying for those that are in authority. Why? Because he gave himself as who? What does it say? First off, 
uh, prayer and thanksgiving may be made on behalf of who? All people. Verse 6, what does it say? Who, he, who gave himself as a ransom for? We need to be praying for all because Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all. Right? You see where this is going? Let's continue to go. Right here. And I love these verses. I wanted to add these. Ezekiel 8, 18, 23 to, and 32. Do I delight in the death of the wicked? It is a declaration of Adonai. Rather, should he not return from his ways and live? What's the saying? God himself, we are quick to deal judgment on people, aren't we? But the Lord of heaven and earth who hates sin more than you and I do, let's just remember that, does not delight in the death of the wicked. What does he continue to say here? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies. It is a declaration of Adonai. So return and live. There's many people in this world that have done wicked things from all walks of life. And you and I can be quick to deal out death and judgment over them. But the Lord himself says, I delight, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Why? What's the desire of Jesus? That all will be saved. So you and I need to get that exact same mindset. Hey, Jesus wants all to be saved? Okay, Lord, I want all to be saved, even if I think they're a rotten person or not. That will just fine-tune you a little more and make sure you keep your judgment somewhere else and focus on what really matters. Right? Let's continue to go here. 1 Corinthians, and this is the last two slides. For I, if I proclaim the good news, again, capitalized, so if I proclaim Jesus, who is Jesus, if I proclaim the good news, I have no reason to boast. For pressure is put on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the good news. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I have been trusted with a commission. Let's pause there. What is he saying? What is Paul saying here? This is very big that we need to get. I have no reason to boast. Why? Because what he is saying here, he's not, he's, not a, he's not just a free person, not bound to anything, saying, hey, today I think that I'm going to go with Nina and Jim Knuckles, and I'm going to go give clothes to the kids. So I'm going to go. I'm free. I have a free day Saturday. Is that a great thing to do? Yes, right? That's a great thing to do. I'm going to go with Nina and Jim Knuckles and, I'm, and, and Carol, and I'm going to go clothe kids in the school systems that need it. I can be happy about that in, 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 in an appropriate and healthy way. I can be happy about that. You and I don't get that luxury when it comes to preaching the gospel because it's not something we choose to do because a master doesn't choose to do what his king asks him. If I'm really a bond servant of the Lord, and if I've said, Jesus, I'm going to follow you, when he asks me to go after the lost and to preach the gospel, it's not me saying, oh, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I'm going to go do that. Look at me. I'm preaching the gospel. No, it's here when he says, Jeremy, preach the gospel. The bond servant in me says, yes, Lord. The lover in me says, yes, Lord, I'll do it. But the bond servant in me says, wait a minute. This isn't an option. This is something I've been entrusted with. The Lord gave me this job to do. And so as he, Jesus being my king and as me being the bond servant, what does a bond servant say to the king? That is exactly what these verses are talking about right here. And woe to me if I don't proclaim, right? Let's just talk it in the analogy I've said. Woe to the person who doesn't do what the king asks him to do. That's what this is about. We've lost the, the, the edge to we are here. You and I are here right now. We've been clothed with power to see miracle signs and wonders. But the end result should be souls. And it doesn't mean miracle signs and wonders are only for those that are lost. Because we're called to pray for all people. Right? Paul didn't say, is anyone sick among you? Just make sure they don't believe and have them come so the elders can lay hands on them. He said, whoever is sick among you, whoever is sick among you, believer and unbeliever, come up, lay hands, anoint them with oil so they can be made whole. What then is my reward? This is the reward for you and I. It's not that we can boast that we preach the gospel. This is the reward that you and I need to think of when it comes to evangelism. That when I preach, I may present the gospel news free of charge. Not making use of my right in the good news. For I am free from all men. If, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win over more of them. This is something I want us to remember right here. 
Now the apostle Paul was given because he had the office of an apostle. But woe to us if we don't preach. Because what did Jesus commission them to do? Go out and do what? Make disciples of all nations. And so that's not a command that we can be like, oh yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Maybe I'll do that today. No. It's yes, Lord, my king. You want me to make disciples of all nations? I'm doing it. And we've been given the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. So it's not like he just said go and you got to figure out how to get it done. You have the spirit of the living God among us. Last slide. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 to 5. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom, proclaiming to you the mystery of God. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words or wisdom, but where? But in demonstration of the spirit of power, so that your faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I want to read a verse right here, and I want Adam to come up and share something, and then we're going to go into prayer. So you know that we've been, uh, every once in a while, we, we pray into, uh, we, we don't do it diligently because it wasn't a gathering feast, but even though you can, it was more like Shabbat where the neighborhood people will come together and have a meal and come together, right? But Rosh Kadesh, you've heard me talk about before, and, and I still, every once in a while, I'll give a little bit of feedback that we don't need to do that, which you're right, we don't need to do anything. We don't even need to be here, right? But we're here because we love Jesus, Right? Rosh Kadesh, the new moon, is a symbol of Jesus, always bringing a time of renewing. That one season ends and the new one begins, and that is Jesus Christ. There's always a newness of life to Jesus. And so they come together, right? Well, Rosh Kadesh was on last Friday, right? Guess who had a dream on Friday? Adam Barker. And the dream has everything to do with what Rosh Kadesh represents. So I want him to share this, and then I want to get into this, to this verse here. Can you get that? Because my, Thanks. And I want us to pay attention because I believe this is a dream straight from the throne. Adam, go for it. Am I? Okay. <laughs> I had a dream where uh, our church was gathered together. It's like a conference hall in a hotel or something. We were gathered together, and uh, we were kind of broken up into small groups for prayer, and we were praying for healing. And uh, it was five or six people gathered around, and um, we would pray and there was a boiled egg we were holding uh, and um, we would pray and then take a little bite of that boiled egg and pass it to someone else and I remember when I prayed I felt so pure devout in my desire and I did that and I, I just felt like okay God's going to do it this time and handed the egg on and it, uh, and it didn't happen and then when I woke up, of course, that sounds weird, right? <laughs> I was like, and I felt like it was a, a God dream. It was something I was supposed to pay attention to. It had a message in it. And what God brought to mind is how many times throughout the history of Christianity have people incorporated things in and made uh, ceremonies and uh, practices out of them that missed the mark? Some of them were a little off, some of them were a lot off, but it missed the mark. It wasn't God's plan. We've been praying about, we uh, saw a service Randy Clark led up in Lancaster, and there was 165 or something saved in a period of a few minutes, not saved, 165 healed in a period of a few minutes. A bunch more got saved too, and that was awesome. Um, Curry Blake has healing services all the time and see so many healed. Uh, Bethel, Bill Johnson, they see so many people healed, and we want that here. And we've had testimonies of uh, healing from our congregation. It's not what we want to see yet, but there's so many and it's so powerful. Uh, but there's been numerous people, it's been a little while ago, uh, things don't always happen as quick as we like, but they independently received words from God saying that this will be a house of healing, that all those who came in seeking healing would be healed. And we want that. And after we went up there, I was thinking about praying about, you know, how do we move closer into that? You know, do I look at these other services, at the way they do them, and draw from that and try and learn from that? And I really felt like God was saying, no, he has something fresh for us. And he will fulfill his word. And it's not going to be what Curry Blake says. It's not going to be what Randy Clark says. It's going to be what he has for us. So that was a little guidance for me. 
but it's also encouragement that he is going to be doing that. And I think, too, this healing thing, God doesn't just care about our physical bodies. He doesn't just care about our spiritual. He cares about our emotional, too. He cares about all of us. And this healing, I believe, is not just for our bodies. It's healing for our souls, too. And when I was praying before service this morning, as I was walking through the pews, I kept seeing this, like a cracked surface, a fracture. And I felt like God wants to heal fractured souls this morning. So let's pray into that. Let's pray into that. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises. And Lord, when you give a word of something like you did, that this will be a house of healing, we want it now. But Lord, your way, mm-hmm. not ours, nothing of us, all you. So Lord, we pray for the fractured souls here this morning, those walking around with cracks in their hearts. Lord, we pray that your living water will flow into those cracks, make them whole, mend them. As we walk through this week, those fractures in us, those places we feel shattered, be made whole in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. So as we're coming to the end here, I want us to really, and just don't move yet, worship team, because I want us to catch this. This is so important that we have to catch. This came in prayer this morning. When Moses would encounter God in the tent of meeting, what would happen to his face? His face would illuminate. Why? With his own light? What, what, what was it illuminating? The glory of God. Right? So he would put a veil over his face, not because he didn't want people to see the glory, but remember why? Why did he put a veil over his face? Because he didn't want Israel to see a glory that fades. That's what it says in the Bible, right? So we see here, 2 Corinthians, now follow me here. Now if the mystery of death, the law, carved into letters on stone, came with such a glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of his glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit even have more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the law, which we could never fulfill on our own, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all. Because of the glory that surpasses it. I'm going to pause there and read something here. I want to ask you a question. Moses hid his face because of a glory that was fading, that was coming to an end. Right? There's going to be a glory now through the ministry of the Holy Spirit that surpasses what Moses had. And so even though Moses had a glory that was so great, Israel was afraid to look upon it. And number one, it was a glory that was fading away. I need you guys to hear me with this. Right? Now we have a ministry of the Spirit. And the ministry of the Spirit has a glory that surpasses even what they could see there with Israel. I want to read this. Now where the Spirit of the Lord is... Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree, from one degree of glory to another. From this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So you and I, right now, unveiled faces, see God. When you have the glory of God, what is happening? From one degree of glory to another, what is that telling you? That the glory is increasing, not decreasing. Right? So why is it that we have ever allowed the church or our own mindset or to believe that the glory of the Holy Spirit is diminishing and that the gifts and power for the disciples and they've only gone off? Do you realize how far we have missed it when the glory of God that came into the Spirit surpassed the glory of the law and was supposed to be a glory that kept on getting bigger, 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 bigger? We've allowed preachers to preach that the glory of God has gotten smaller, 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 smaller. We're not in the Old Testament. We're not a part of a law that's dying. We're a part of the Spirit. We're alive in Jesus Christ. We're called to be clothed in power. We're called to lay hands on the sick. We're called to see people here. We're called to say words that will set the captive free. I don't know why we ever allowed ourselves to believe that we are a part of a ministry whose glory diminishes and not increases. We cannot go back to that place. So holy, holy, holy. We're going to be coming into a time of prayer, but uh, worship team, please come up. But we need to, this is a time of coming to the altar and saying, Lord, forgive me. 
for allowing myself to believe in a ministry of the Holy Spirit that diminishes. Because what? That's borderline blasphemy. That's against the Holy Spirit of God to ever rest upon that. Spirit of the law was a diminishing glory. The spirit, the glory of, sorry, the glory of the law was a diminishing glory. The glory of the spirit is an increasing glory. It's an increasing glory. Comes down, goes up, and continues to go up. You and I are going into this place. So first off, Lord, forgive us for ever believing in a glory that diminishes. Lord, set us ablaze. Lord, second thing, Lord, forgive us for treating the Great Commission as a great option. Now I also want to come for a time of prayer. At least